Minister. And Deputy First Minister. And we move on now to questions to the Minister for Regional Development. And again, we start with topical questions. And I call Dominic Bradley. Romil Mayogat, Lash Concordia, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That's twice in the one day. I think I'll, I'll do the lottery. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, could I ask the Minister um, for his assessment of the current parking situation in the city of Newry? Grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary or his topical question and uh, to uh, assure him that I am uh, very much aware of, of the issues in relation to uh, car parking across Northern Ireland and, uh, and of course in, in uh, Newry City. Uh, and I know that uh, he indeed uh, held a, a recent meeting uh, in the Arts Centre with, with traders and uh, local representatives. Uh, and as a result of that, I think um, uh, a request has been made to meet with me uh, to discuss the issue. Uh, um, the member will know that um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the parking arrangements in, in Newry have been greatly enhanced recently by the, by the new car park facility at North Street. Uh, and indeed uh, the car park in the, in, the, in the vicinity of the Catherine Street area. So the um, member also knows that there is the DSD scheme, uh, which is uh, uh, currently underway uh, and uh, which will in fact be um, uh, reducing the number of available car parking spaces. But that is a scheme that, uh, as I say, is the responsibility of DSD in conjunction with, with the local council. I can compete with many things, but a mobile phone, I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> would, would somebody ask to put salt and vinegar in their chips, please? Because <laughs> Back to the issue of, of, of car parking in Uri, I am happy to meet the member and local representatives. My door, as always, is open. Can I remind all members to turn the mobile phones off? Dominic Bradley for supplementary. From I got the last Concordia. Um, could I ask the Minister uh, if he would respond positively to a suggestion put forward by local traders that uh, an hour's free parking should be available to shoppers in Newry? I'm grateful to the member for the, um, uh, for the point that he raises. I, I, I have actually made the suggestion and my door remains open to the prospect uh, that, that local councils can help um, offset car parking charges for particular periods of time, say they run up to Christmas. Uh, and indeed Newton Abbey uh, Council have successfully uh, negotiated with, uh, with my officials an arrangement for Ballyclare. Uh, and, and so therefore that facility is uh, uh, available for local councils for, uh, to, to, to assist uh, the local economy in the run up to specified periods such as Christmas. Uh, uh, and, uh, and certainly, if that is a suggestion that is helpful in the Newry context, then I'm happy to explore it. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recently shared in the excitement and delight of the announcement that the Giro d'Italia is coming to Northern Ireland. And given the, the Regional Development Minister's uh, commitment to cycling and the announcement of his new cycling unit, uh, will he and his department be in a position? to take the lead on the Giro d'Italia legacy. Grateful to, the, great, great, grateful, to the, grateful to the member for her uh, enthusiastic uh, response to uh, Giro d'Italia and it is something that I am particularly enthusiastic about and I did have the opportunity uh, in advance of the, uh, the final decision being made by the racing authorities to bring it to Northern Ireland, have an opportunity along with uh, Minister Foster to, to impress the need for such a prestige event to take place in Northern Ireland. And of course, with the advent uh, of my new cycling unit, I, I strongly believe that, that we have the potential to lead actually on that, uh, on that uh, uh, initiative. Uh, members were, were discussing amongst themselves whether or not I was ready for racing myself in pink lycra. I can tell you that I am, <laughs> and, that, and that, that I have my jersey ready. Uh, but on a serious point, uh, I, I, I do think Giro d'Italia will afford cycling the opportunity for worldwide promotion, as well as showing off some of the great tourist sites. Yeah and some of the great infrastructure that we have. 
uh, not least along uh, uh, in and around Belfast, not least the Antrim coast, but in my own constituency uh, of Armagh, Newry and Armagh, and I hope very much that, that members and, and this executive will take the opportunity, and if it means that active promotion is better done by my department as a result of the new cycling unit that, uh, that, that, that I have formed, then I think that is the way forward. Yeah. I call Sandra Overend. Hey, thank you very much and thank the Minister for that response. Um, if the Regional Development Minister was given the leading role in building that Giro d'Italia legacy, what would his priorities be? Well, I'm grateful again to the, uh, to, to the member for, for uh, her supplementary question and uh, I, I can say that uh, I, I think we are embarking on a cycling revolution. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that everyone will embrace it with the enthusiasm that I have uh, and will we'll see it as an opportunity. Um, I was recently involved in discussions with Transport for London uh, on the delivery of their uh, cycle hire scheme, the Boris Bikes as they're called, uh, and the legacy approach that they took uh, to hosting uh, after the, su the success of the Tour de France. So uh, I think uh, Perhaps it's the case that, that many people don't realise the, the potential or the impact that Giro d'Italia can have, not only for cycling but also for tourism and for a feel-good factor. Uh, and I want to say that I, I think it's, a, it's on a scale of World Place and Fire Games and the Irish Open, uh, and it has the potential to be even bigger than that. I want to see, therefore, a cycling legacy carried forward after Giro d'Italia. Yeah. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. What importance does the Minister um, attach to the uh, upgrading of the strategic roads infrastructure on the North Coast and the North West in general? I'm grateful to the Member for his uh, uh, question, and, and of course the Member uh, will know the, the very good uh, recent announcement uh, that the A26, uh, the um, to, uh, Larryford uh, stretch of road uh, has been given uh, uh, approval by the Finance Minister. I'm very pleased uh, that, that that is the case. There were, um, uh, I made very strong uh, um, representations around the executive table and indeed to the Finance, finance Minister himself. And I know that uh, success has many fathers. And uh, the amount of people who claim credit for the A26 has been astonishing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded somewhat of the, of the story, the legendary story between Con, uh, Conrad Hilton and Zaza Gabor, who were married for a while, uh, but the marriage failed. And Zaza was asked on the steps of the court as to why the marriage had failed, and she simply said, we had only one thing in common, his money. <laughs> um, I think I have more things in common, perhaps, than the finance, uh, with the finance minister, but I am glad that he accepted my arguments on the A26. I think it will enhance and improve um, the, the, the strategic road network there, not least for tourism um, uh, facilities, uh, and I think there is broad and general welcome to everyone, uh, from everyone, that A26 is now going to be a reality. I call Gregory Campbell. Uh, I thank the Minister uh, for his response and the positive outcome of the A26 announcement. Would he agree with me that uh, the further and more that we can do as a, a, an Assembly and the Executive and him as Roads Minister to improve the continuity of the A26 right as far as the uh, Causeway Hospital as well as the impending A6 between Dungiven and Drumahoe, uh, the more we will be able to set at ease those who have concerns that money isn't being spent on the North Coast and in the North West. Grateful to the member for uh, the, the point that he raises, and, and clearly as, as Transport Minister, uh, I am a very strong believer in improving the strategic road network and improving and enhancing the connectivity uh, um, all over Northern Ireland, and that's why I, I, I was also pleased that, as part of the, uh, of the October monitoring exercise, some money has been set aside to bring forward uh, the AS6 scheme. And I know that uh, other members of this House are, are, are also uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, about that scheme, um, as I am indeed. Uh, and, and generally, I think the economics of this makes pure sense. It means uh, it, uh, simply that if you can improve connectivity with all parts of Northern Ireland, then you improve the chances uh, of, of greater job uh, uh, prospects and uh, the, the ability to move people and goods at, um, uh, at the easiest possible manner, as well as the jobs that it undoubtedly creates within uh, the road construction industry. I call Cahill Boylan. 
Gorm, I'll get the last one call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister is well aware that the, the Committee did a report into unadapted roads recently, and one of the recommendations was in relation to working with NILGA on a prioritisation audit. Could the Minister give us a progress report in relation to that and whether or not he's met with NILGA? Well, I'm, I, I'm grateful to the member for um, the, the issue that he raises, and, and he will know that um, there is a, a, a substantial issue in terms of legacy, uh, legacy projects where um, uh, the uh, unfinished developments and, and roads which need, uh, which need to be uh, adopted. I've had discussions uh, with, with various um, interested bodies. Uh, I know that uh, NILGA are interested um, in this issue and indeed I have discussed it with them and we would hope to carry forward uh, those discussions. I have to say there, there is a price tag, uh, a very high price tag on uh, possible upgrading uh, where um, the department being asked to do it, we simply couldn't afford to do it uh, and even uh, I doubt if the executive could afford to do it as well. But I think it's working uh, in partnership with those who are directly involved in these issues that, that, uh, that can uh, lead to hopefully uh, an improvement uh, because I, I, I understand the frustration and the problems that many householders face uh, uh, living in estates uh, which are unfinished in terms of sometimes roads and water and, and therefore uh, uh, it is important that, uh, that we try and make progress on it but it is not one for an easy solution. I call Cathal Boylan. Uh, last one, Colin August, going to selection area as up to Ragnar. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. And the Minister has clearly outlined that it is a difficult situation, and many uh, um, people are con complaining about developments not being finished. But could I ask the Minister then, when does he propose uh, to meet with Nilga, and when does he propose then to bring forward a solution, working with partners, as he has indicated, to try? and get a, a resolution to these problems. I'm grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary and, and, and to assure him that I am uh, and will be directly engaged in, in working with um, everyone uh, who has a contribution to, uh, to try and bring a solution to this uh, uh, issue. I know it's assured by uh, uh, members of the House on all sides uh, in their correspondence and in their dealing with constituency, uh, uh, constituency matters, as indeed uh, it is raised with me on a regular basis through the work um, in, in the New and Armagh constituency. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware that Strangford and Porta Ferry in, in recent years are now enjoying the benefits of tourism arriving off cruise ships, but this has given rise to some access and security issues. Could the Minister update us on, on what he's doing to resolve those issues? Well, I, I'm grateful to the member uh, for his interest in this matter and indeed uh, the, the, the helpful attitude that he has adopted to it. Uh, he will know that at my request, uh, Whitehall Department for uh, Transport Officials uh, met with my uh, officials at Strangford uh, to examine my proposal to use the existing pontoon fenced off area as a temporary restricted area. Um, it was agreed that with prescribed management procedures, the existing fenced off, uh, uh, fenced off area would suffice as a restricted area. And on this point, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to secure agreement uh, with the owners of the pontoon. Um, if agreement is not able to be obtained, I, I have established uh, the fallback position of a temporary fence mechanism which would facilitate individual cruise ship visits. It is important, uh, as the member has uh, again uh, underlined, uh, it's important for me to ensure that uh, this important area continues to benefit uh, from cruise ship uh, passenger traffic without providing any adverse visual impact to one of Northern Ireland's most scenic areas. I call Mike Nesbitt. Well, I thank the Minister for his answer, which, which is a positive contrast to some of the, the media reporting. Does he agree with me that it was regrettable that the, the public debate uh, got ahead of the fact? Well, I do uh, agree very much that it was very unfortunate that, uh, again, a um, uh, 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 particular uh, spin on this story was put out before um, uh, we could find uh, the accurate uh, explanation, but I'm, I'm satisfied to, uh, to, to say that it, it gave me the opportunity uh, to uh, bring forward, I think, a very good solution and a positive uh, solution to this. Uh, I'm pleased that we've secured agreement on a mechanism of uh, compliance without 
visual impact. Let me say, like he, uh, I am committed to Strangford. I am committed to cruise ship access to the area, and I am committed, as he would also know, to the local ferry services, uh, which, uh, as the member is aware and pleased to say, we're en route to replacing. Yeah, yeah. And that is the end of topical questions, and we now move on to oral questions that have been listed. Question number one has been transferred to the Department of Finance and Personnel uh, for a written response, and question three has been withdrawn. I call Pam Brown. Question number two, please. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Board of Northern Ireland Water is responsible for the employment of a suitable Chief Executive uh, and appointed Pena PLC as an executive search company to support it in the recruitment process. Uh, following an extensive assessment exercise, uh, four of six shortlisted candidates were interviewed for the post. Two candidates withdrew prior to interview. However, the interview panel considered that no candidate met the full competencies required for the post and no appointment was made. Uh, my department and NI Water are li liaising uh, on the way forward for the appointment of a new Chief Executive. The NIW Board has appointed uh, an interim Chief Executive pending completion of the recruitment process. Could the Minister clarify if any questions have been grouped? Uh, yes. Is, is right. yeah. okay. I call Pam Brown for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister t um, outline uh, how much the failed process has cost the public purse and when the new Chief Executive will be in post? Grateful to the Member for her uh, supplementary question. I, I can confirm that uh, costs to date are, are in the, going to be in the region of £70,000, uh, and uh, obviously um, uh, efforts, strenuous efforts will be being made by uh, the Board of Northern Ireland Water in conjunction and in consultation with the Department as to how quickly we, we, we can move forward to resolve this situation. I call Ross Hussey for a supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Would the Minister agree with me that it is better to bid for a candidate of the right standard than appoint a top applicant to fall short of the required standard? I, I agree absolutely, uh, Chairman, uh, and uh, it is always important to secure the best candidate for any position and particularly uh, that uh, of uh, um, the Chief Executive of uh, Northern Ireland Water. Uh, and I think um, the principle of merit uh, should uh, always be the abiding principle. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, would, would the Minister not agree with me that given the performance of some previous Chief Executives of Northern Ireland Water, that there must have been someone in that pile who was up to it? And does he not agree? Uh, with other members in this House, that £70,000 is money that Northern Ireland and Water can ill afford to squander on a process that delivered nothing. I am grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I would say that uh, certainly uh, in my tenure uh, as Minister uh, of Regional Development, uh, I was nothing but impressed by the, the performance of Trevor Hazlitt, uh, who uh, retired recently as Chief Executive uh, uh, Officer. It may well be that uh, uh, the member uh, uh, is referring to um, a different uh, time period, but uh, certainly I, I was very satisfied um, at the leadership uh, and the confidence uh, which uh, Trevor Hazlitt uh, and the dedication of Trevor, Trevor Hazlitt as he brought uh, NI water forward after uh, a very difficult period. Let me say that um, it, it is important that we get uh, the right person. I can tell uh, the member that uh, a total of 84 candidates were interested or expressed interest in this position, but after um, careful consideration, um, the, the, the panel uh, concluded that it was, uh, 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 it was not satisfied to make an appointment. Um, I regret, of course, uh, the, the, the potential cost, but ultimately I think uh, everyone has agreed that, uh, that uh, the appointment, when it is made, has to be the right appointment. Moving on, I call Michelle McElveen. Question for Mr Deputy Speaker. Question. Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, 
My, uh, my department co-funded and uh, facilitated the construction of a new cycle bridge across the Bally Rainy Road in partnership with uh, Sustrains and Down Rural Area Partnership. These works were completed in March 2012. Regrettably, and by virtue of the provision of a new bridge over the Bally Rainy Road uh, associated earthworks and embankments, it was not possible to retain the existing accesses. Uh, officials have over recent months investigated the possibility of providing an alternative access point um, onto the Greenway cycle route in the vicinity of Bally Rainy Road Junction and a number of options are being explored. However, alternative walkway uh, access options considered to date are proving to be financially prohibitive, estimated at £160,000. Land implications are also proving difficult as there is a need to purchase additional lands not under public ownership. Unfortunately, at present, my department has no funding source available to pursue the matter further at this time. I call Michelle McElveen. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the response from, from the Minister. Um, that, would have been, that would have been the answer to my supplementary. Um, but could he possibly give me an answer as to whether he's considering extending the Cumber Greenway to link with Cumber Town Centre? Well, I'm grateful to the, to the member for, um, for, for her supplementary uh, 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 question. Um, and, and obviously, um, uh, it would be a strong desire at some point uh, to, to establish that link. Um, it's not proving easy uh, financially or pragmatically to, 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 to carry uh, that out at present, but we will continue to work with, with the local group and, uh, and the various interests to see if we can identify a means forward. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I uh, must express some disappointment at the Minister's response in relation to the, the access at the Valley Rainy Road, because there was an access at the Valley Rainy Road prior to the bridge being built, and that is uh, convenient to a uh, car park. And I'm, I just and can we have a question, please? I simply ask the Minister uh, will he continue with his efforts to ensure that there is an access there at that very important uh, junction? Well, I'm grateful to the uh, member uh, for his supplementary question. Um, it, it, it seems, you know, he, he's criticising me for for uh, carrying out the work to, to get the bridge in place. Um, and now that the work's done, uh, there are pragmatic problems. Some of them outside the direct control of of the department. Um, but we, we we will continue to explore um, uh, avenues of, uh, where we can hopefully resolve these issues. I am simply highlighting the fact that um, it is not uh, within my immediate gift uh, to create those accesses, that they, uh, it comes with land ownership and indeed um, financial restrictions. I call Sandra Overend. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses. And we have talked already today about the Regional Development Minister's commitment to cycling. Um, can the Minister detail the rationale behind his two million bid uh, for cycle funding in the recent October monitoring round? I uh, thank the Member uh, for her supplementary and indeed uh, for her interest in all of these matters. Um, my department applied for £2 million in the October monitoring round to supplement funding uh, to provide infrastructure in and around schools participating in the active school travel programme. Uh, unfortunately, the, the bid was, was not successful, but a very limited funding uh, package was made available by way of the local transport safety measures uh, that may become available to support uh, infrastructure close uh, by schools participating in the active school travel uh, programme. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question 5, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, following completion of the flyover type junction at Dremore Road, Hillsborough, traffic surveys were carried out to establish the level uh, of usage. These surveys, undertaken between the 17th and 23rd of October 2012, indicated uh, the two way traffic on this new flyover was 5,681 vehicles per day. Officials are aware that some northbound traffic during the morning peak chooses to leave the A1 at the junction travel through the centre of Hillsborough village and rejoin the A1 to the north of the village at the roundabout. This is considered to be partly as a result of traffic delays experienced at the Hillsborough roundabout. As the member is aware, uh, I have met with her and concerned representatives and I understand uh, the nature of the situation. However, uh, it is difficult to find a practical solution to these difficulties. Uh, officials in my department's road service have looked um, at a number of options to improve the, the traffic capacity of the Hillsborough roundabout in order to reduce delays and thereby encourage strategic 
or through traffic, not to divert off the A1 and travel through the village. Officials believe uh, the situation could be significantly improved in the short term by the installation of traffic signals at the roundabout in order to minimise delays in the morning peak. A a scheme to provide part-time traffic signal control has been designed. It has not, however, been progressed as uh, initial informal consultation indicated there was limited support for the scheme amongst the various parties. Officials remain of the view that the scheme to provide part-time signals on the Hillsborough roundabout would be a benefit and help towards reducing traffic currently going through the village in the morning peak. I can advise officials had planned to have convened a meeting with local representatives in order to determine if a way forward can be found. However, this has not uh, progressed as quickly as I had hoped, and I have asked officials to contact you directly within the next two weeks to arrange a suitable date and time to meet. I call Brenda Hill. I thank the Minister there for his detailed answer. And given that the actual flyover at the A1 has increased the traffic into Hillsborough, as you said, by 124%, would you agree that an impact assessment to include noise pollution should be carried out in Hillsborough Village, as it is a major thoroughfare for events at Hillsborough Castle and the RUAS site at the maze? And furthermore, could the Minister clarify what long term management, traffic management plan he has in place other than traffic lights for Hillsborough Village? Well, I, I, I think. Uh, grateful to the member for her um, supplementary question uh, and indeed in, term, in terms of longer term plans uh, for uh, to try and ease or resolve the situation would include uh, the great separation uh, of the junction as part of the M1A1 uh, spruce field uh, bypass uh, uh, proposals um, and of course um, and it's intended that that proposal will also uh, consider congestion at the roundabout junction on the A1 at Hillsborough Can I say that Road Service has commissioned uh, consultants to consider a range uh, of options to evaluate all of the the viable options for capacity enhancement uh, along this route? Uh, We will continue to do that and of course we will um, continue to consult with local groups and local representatives as we move forward. Moving on, I call Basil McRae. Question number six, please. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Trans-European Transport Network Regulation articulates the European Commission's vision for the creation of a seamless Europe-wide transport infrastructure which must be in place by 2050. This vision brings many requirements and those applying to the core network must be in place by 2030. In delivering this vision, the European Commission has estimated that the cost of implementing the first financing phase for the core network for the 2014-2020 to period to be in the region of £212 billion. uh, As first presented, the 10T regulation imposed many requirements in the shape of uh, new technical standards, infrastructure enhancements and unrealistic deadlines uh, on the United Kingdom as a member state and thus on Northern Ireland as a region. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have taken a robust uh, uh, approach with the European institutions to ensure that the regional circumstances of Northern Ireland have been understood and taken into account. I work closely with Westminster to represent a strong and united member state position. I have secured the support of our members of the European Parliament and met with key contacts in Europe, including Vice President of the European Commission, Sim Callas, and Brian Simpson, the Chair of the European Parliament's Transport Committee. The reality of our, of our actions is that without successfully securing exemptions, including the isolated network uh, status for our rail, we would have been forced uh, to refocus investment in our transport network away from planned and appropriate improvement in order to uh, reach the required standards, despite there being no economically viable case for us to do so. My interventions have made sure that the tremendous progress we have made to date in growing public transport passenger numbers is not placed in jeopardy. I call Basil McRae. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. If I understand the Minister correctly, uh, he is uh, arguing that he has successfully reduced the amount of investment required and that this is a good thing. Um, would he confirm whether he believes that Northern Ireland has adequate levels of investment in our transport uh, network to remain competitive? And would he care to comment on the recent CBI report, which highlighted concerns amongst the business community at the lack of a pipeline of infrastructure projects? Grateful to the member for his supplementary question, although he does uh, appear to have misunderstood even the thrust of his own question, uh, and certainly the extent of my answer. <laughs> well, the, 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 the point that I've made is 
<laughs> well, no, the point that I've made is, as a result of the work that I've brought forward in Europe and the representations that I've made to senior European figures in both the Commission and the Parliament and other places, is that it, it, it was no longer necessary for Northern Ireland to spend vast sums of money on um, improvements that uh, were, we feel were unnecessary. Better to spend it on upgrading and the provision of new services and better services. Uh, and that's why I, I take satisfaction from the work uh, that, we've, that we've carried out, that we're not having to, to, to re-spend money, already expended, uh, to, to improve things that we can move on and build on the progress that we've made. Can I say I was interested in the CBI report uh, and I, I agree very much that uh, the spending money on key infrastructural um, uh, projects is key to the regeneration of the economy here. And as Transport Minister, uh, I see that as my role around the executive table. And I want to carry forward those projects um, uh, forward to the benefit uh, of the people of Northern Ireland. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, 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 can the Minister tell us, has he had any success in having the Trans-European Network extended beyond the Eastern Seaboard and into the West? Well, what we've, what we've sought to do uh, through the member, and the member will know as a member of the, of the Regional Development Committee, and we've, uh, we've uh, had good assistance from them also in terms of uh, making the representations. Um, I think what, we, what we're seeking to do, rather than um, deal with the, with the core network simply, the comprehensive network which involves upgrading schemes to the benefit of all parts of Northern Ireland, uh, is going to be the key feature moving forward. And it's to try and attract, obviously, European assistance and, and investment to that. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not precious about um, where those schemes uh, take place, particularly as long as they do take place and upgrade the, uh, the, 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 the overall infrastructure, the network in, uh, infrastructure of Northern Ireland. And I think my record as Minister proves that. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome what the Minister has said and thank him for the work that he has done in relation to lobbying in Europe for the 10 t funding. Can the Minister say what chances are we likely to have with Northern Ireland trying to obtain funds in relation to TNT roads rather than the rail? Well, again, uh, the, what we've argued uh, closely and what we've helped inform Europe as to the nature of both our, our road networks and our rail uh, networks and the fact that the, there's no freight moves uh, on, on our railways, our, our gauges our rail gauges are, are different sizes, so we can never have high-speed railway connections between Belfast and Dublin, or, or certainly the cost of that would be um, prohibitive. But as well as that, uh, but we do need uh, rail assistance uh, to improve the infrastructure, for, for instance, um, uh, on, on uh, the link between Belfast and Dublin. Uh, and that particular service could do with an investment uh, of monies, as well as the various road schemes uh, that will improve connectivity throughout Northern Ireland. Moving on, I call Sammy Wilson. Deputy Speaker, question number seven. Um, can I say to the member, I have had no discussions with NI Water regarding the location of wind turbines on sites under its control. Uh, the Department has been engaging with NI Water and other stakeholders on future investment priorities for the water sector. Uh, this includes exploring the options for re renewable energy to help manage costs and meet the Executive's Programme for Government and strate uh, Strategic Energy fra Framework commitments. Uh, I plan to consult on draft social and environmental guidance, setting out all our uh, priorities uh, shortly. For the answer, the DORD committee has been told by NI Water that they intend to uh, look at uh, erecting 350 foot high turbines in the Silent Valley area. Can he give an assurance that he will neither encourage such a development and indeed will actually discourage a development of this nature that would destroy the landscape in the area, would hurt the tourist industry and of course would damage his own constituents? 
Well, I'm grateful to the, to the member uh, for his supplementary question, and I'm grateful to the opportunity to set uh, uh, the record straight on this, because I believe there has been some um, un unhelpful comment uh, on this and uh, misguided comment uh, on it. Um, I, have, I can confirm that uh, Northern Ireland Water have no current proposals. I, have, I, I confirm also that I have no proposals uh, or any plans for wind farms in, uh, in the morns. Um, uh, and NI Water has advised that it does not foresee the development of wind farms uh, in, uh, in the Mourns. And of course, he will know that any, any such proposals would need to go through a business case, regulatory, and planning approval processes. But I am very happy to place on record that, um, uh, that in an area of outstanding natural beauty uh, in the Mourns, uh, that I have no intention uh, of putting forward proposals, and I do not believe NI Water have either. I call Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister has told us about the Mourns. Could he give us expand a bit more uh, about some other areas and tell us what efforts that uh, Northern Ireland Water are going to try and provide uh, renewable energy to try and provide lower bills for, for many overstretched customers? Well, I, I'm, 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 I'm grateful uh, uh, to the member. Uh, and of course, the member will know that. Um, the, the executive's um, strategic energy framework includes a target for, for generating 40 per cent of our electricity from renewable sources by 2020. The programme for government includes a commitment to continue uh, working towards uh, a reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions by at least 35 per cent on 1990 levels by 2025. And, uh, and of course, uh, the member will also know uh, that renewable energy and emissions target uh, fall under the remit of both the Deddy Minister and his party colleague, the DOE Ministers, uh, uh, Minister, respectively. Moving on, I call Mervyn Storey. Question number eight, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, in November last year, I officially opened a new walking and cycling railway bridge in Balamoni. Um, I were, uh, I'm aware of a recent case that was brought uh, to the members' attention, and I'm naturally sympathetic to people in that situation. Um, it is important to bear in mind, uh, though, that the new footbridge was taken forward in partnership with Balamoni Council and Sustrians, uh, and was designed in compliance with Disability Discrimination Act uh, regulations. Uh, safety of the general public is paramount, and that is why the bridge replaced the unmanned level crossing and provides uh, safe access to and from the town, giving greater opportunity for the community to walk and cycle as part of their daily routine to work or school. Uh, prior to this, passengers had to cross the tracks in order to access both platforms via a temporary footbridge or uh, a barrow path at track level. I am happy to meet, of course, with, the member, uh, with any member of the public um, experiencing difficulties using the new bridge and to discuss how we can assist them in making their journey more easily. I call Mervyn Story. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his reply. And, and can I also place on record the appreciation of the constituents who have contacted me uh, in terms of the way in which TransLink has uh, at least accommodated uh, initial meetings, while unfortunately the outcome has still been the same. Uh, the, the issue still remains that there are people who have disabilities for whom the new bridge, which is, uh, I believe, something of worth and value to the station, but they cannot access it in a practical way. And we have a situation whereby TransLink, uh, thankfully, removed a possible prosecution of a disabled person for crossing the line. Could the member come to the question, because please? Because he could not access the new bridge. I appreciate the Minister has agreed to meet, but will he give an assurance that an alternative can be put in place to facilitate those small number of people, my constituents, who are actually uh, set at a disadvantage in relation to the current arrangement. Grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary uh, question. I, I, and I do have genuine sympathy for the, for, for the case that was brought forward. And I'm glad that um, uh, TransLink officials did uh, adopt uh, a very sensible approach and sensitive approach uh, in the handling of this case. I suppose it, 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 it does come down to the fact that, that um, it, it's to reduce the dangers involved in, in having to, to cross the tracks, um, and, uh, um, which was the historic way people um, 
uh, went across that route and, and, and to reduce uh, or to improve safety conditions uh, in terms of that. Uh, as I said, I, I'm happy to meet uh, the member and uh, uh, any constituent, uh, con uh, constituent uh, in relation to the matter. But um, the provision of the new bridge, as it is um, compliant with uh, disability legislation, um, uh, I, I think as a structure it is impressive. I think um, uh, the member will accept that uh, um, Balamoni Station uh, uh, is the better for it. Uh, we will continue to uh, uh, look at these issues, uh, but I think, uh, um, you know, I think it is difficult because safety has to be the paramount concern. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister detail what has been done to assist people with visual impairments who actually use public transport in general? Well, I'm grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question and, and I'm happy to confirm that last year my department, uh, in conjunction with Guide Dogs and Translink, uh, completed the evaluation of a pilot project uh, involving the provision of audio visual information systems um, on a metro bus service and a number of designated bus stops. I'm pleased to report that the evaluation of the pilot project uh, highlighted the benefits of auto-visual uh, systems for all passengers, but particularly for people uh, with visual impairments and older people. Indeed, the vast majority of respondents stated that audio-visual announcements made journeys easier. Uh, the Department and TransLink is continued, uh, continuing to explore potential funding for uh, the provision of audio-visual systems on the bus network, including any additional solutions that could be provided through advances in technology, particularly through use of uh, smartphones. Uh, it is disappointing that the bid submitted for 2014-15 to enable my department to begin uh, implementing uh, audio-visual systems um, has not uh, been met, but um, my departments are discussing uh, also with RNIB options for uh, a travel aid which people who are visually or hearing impaired or have communication difficulties could uh, show to seek help from transport staff. I call Jim Allister. Are there any plans to deal with overcrowding, which ev evidences itself at peak times on this route the closer it gets to Belfast? Uh, has the Minister any plans to deal with that? I am grateful to the member for um, a supplementary question. Um, it is some way uh, removed from uh, disabled facilities at Balamoni Station, but it is an important aspect, uh, a question nonetheless, and of course he has been ingenious as usual. Um, the, uh, the, the, one of the products uh, of our success in terms of rail uh, has been the increased numbers and increased passengers. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I was waxing lyrical uh, in the earlier debate as to the increased numbers that we are enjoying uh, record levels since uh, 1967 using the train. Um, and of course that presents us then with um, can we transport all of those people safely and in comfort. And, and I know that that's an issue that, uh, that I'm interested in and bringing forward with TransLink to ensure that the maximum level of comfort for the passengers who want to use uh, our, our trains in increasing numbers uh, can be afforded to them. And I will note uh, the members' uh, concern in respect of that line. I call Sean Lynch. Case Tavern May, question nine. Uh, during my predecessor's time, uh, a decision was taken not to carry out full appropriate assessments on the potential impacts on the various uh, designated sites arising out of the F5 WTC project. We're now dealing with the consequences of that, uh, of that decision. Uh, there are currently four reports being developed to, infor, uh, to inform Habitat's regulations assessments of the potential impacts on the various uh, designated sites arising out of the A5WTC project. It's proposed that the consultation on these reports will commence uh, in spring 2014. Uh, following the declaration of uh, reduced budget requirements in 2013-14 and 14-15, my department has received funding to progress the A31 Macrofeld Bypass and the A26 Frosses Road dual carriageway. In order to comply with the judgment, my department needs to proceed carefully. Therefore, the timings and uh, the issues associated with updating the environmental statement are still being considered and developed, and it is not possible to finalise a programme at this time. 
I call Sean Lynch. Good uh, Last can call you. And I'm uh, going to go to the area as in Fragnish. And I want to thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Um, can the Minister um, outline when he would expect the overall project to commence? Well, I, I'm, uh, as I say, um, bearing in mind uh, the judgment uh, that was handed down in respect of these issues. Um, I think it, it would be wrong for me to speculate in terms of, uh, of timescales. What I've simply uh, outlined to you uh, at the moment uh, is that um, uh, the, uh, we're, 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 doing, we're developing uh, the four reports into the, um, the Habitats Regulations Assessments. Uh, I'm aware of, of, of other uh, uh, impacts um, that, that need to be assessed. Uh, it's very important that, that, that we give due care and timely consideration to all these things and that we work our way systematically uh, through a process um, that uh, complies with the judgment uh, that is currently there. And that is the end of question times.